Welcome to season two, episode five of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. My name is Dr. Kirk Megu, and I'm the Public Relations Officer of the United National Congress, the official opposition party in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a unique venture, streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States. We speak with people from around the world, trying to understand different issues and problems relevant to my own country, Trinidad and Tobago, but also to people in sometimes very similar, but sometimes very different situations, cultures, histories, politics, sociology, etc. The goal is to learn from each other, to build networks, to widen our perspectives, and to work for solutions in our distinctive contexts. Today's episode is entitled Geopolitics, the New Cold War, and Developing Countries. Today, the West, embodied by that imperial relic known as the G7, is embarking on a new Cold War directed at China and Russia. What a far cry from the end of the original Cold War in 1990, when the promise of a new world order and globalization sought to bring the world together in a cooperative spirit. That decade saw a lot of progress in developing countries like my own. So much so that by the 21st century, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, Russia India, China, emerged as some of the world's largest and leading economies, actually displacing the old G7 grouping from their position as the world's leading industrial nations. However, the rise of Russia and China in particular had been greeted with hostility and fear by the West and NATO, and new Berlin walls are being attempted to once again pit the world into warring and competitive camps. How will this affect global development, especially for developing countries? For those of us who are not part of either the G7 or Russia or China, what are our options? Do we take sides? Do we remain neutral? Can we remain neutral? To discuss these issues, I'm privileged to have as my guests, Helga Zepp-Larouche from Germany, which was the center of the old Cold War with the Berlin Wall, and Ralph Mirage from Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, let me just give a little bit of an introduction to you all, and then I will invite you to, to expand a little more. But Helga Zepplerusch is the president and founder of the International Schiller Institute in Germany and the Berger Rechenbewegung, I, I know I messed that up, Solidaritat Party, Buzo, Civil Rights Movement, Solidarity. Together with her late husband, the American economist, theorist, and political leader, Lyndon LaRouche. She was at the forefront of spearheading the new international economic order for a just global economy in the 1970s and 1980s. And the World Land Bridge, which became the foundation for the New Silk Road in 2013. Ralph Mirage is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as holder of other ministerial positions. Notably, he has held cabinet level positions across opposing administrations in the 1990s here in Trinidad. He's also an accomplished playwright and actor, starring in what many, including me, believe is the best film ever made in Trinidad and Tobago, BIM, about the rise and fall of an outsider politician. Welcome again. Thank you. Hello. I, I, I'd like to start off by asking you to, to tell us a little more than, than the introduction I gave you. Um, and in particular, if, if we start with Helga and then Ralph, but in particular with Helga, about your involvement in trying to establish the new international economic order, and later the World Land Bridge and the New Silk Road. If you can just tell our audience how and why you got involved and what these things were about. Well, it really started in 1971. I was a young journalist and I had the incredible opportunity 
to travel to China in the middle of the Cultural Revolution on a cargo ship. And, you know, when you travel with a cargo ship, you get a completely different view of the world than if you go with a, uh, a luxury ship because you see, you know, what poverty does to the people. So I had very brief encounters in several African countries, South Asian countries. And I, I came back from that trip with the absolute conviction that the underdevelopment could not remain. So I went back to my studies in Berlin and I found a professor who gave a course on the economic theories of Lyndon LaRouche, my later husband. And he was the only one who said that the most urgent thing to do is the industrialization of Africa, of Latin America, of Asia. And I said, that's it, you know, because that was the clear need I saw. And, you know, then I joined his association. It was not a big movement at that time, it was just a group of students and philosophical minded people. And we started to work on development projects. First for Africa, we had a complete comprehensive plan for the infrastructure development plan of Africa in 76. Then we worked with Indira Gandhi on a 40 year development plan for India. We worked with Lopez Portillo on a Latin American integration economic development plan. And I'm now leaving out a lot of steps, but yeah. when the, the <clears throat> wall came down in Germany, or even before my husband had in 1984 predicted that the Soviet Union would collapse if they would stick to their economic policies of that time. And he was the only one who predicted that correctly. So we worked on an economic development plan for the Comic-Con countries. Um, and when the wall came down, we were the only ones who were prepared for that moment. Not the German government, nobody else expected this to happen. And you know when the Soviet Union then collapsed one year later, two years later in '91, we took that development program, uh, you know, which was basically the idea to connect the industrial and population centers of Europe with those of Asia through development corridors, and we called that the European uh, Eurasian Land Bridge, the New Silk Road. So that is really how it started. And then we made, I would say over the years, hundreds of conferences and seminars on five continents for that project. And then, you know, when in 2013, Xi Jinping, the president of China announced the new Silk Road, we were extremely happy because this completely corresponded to what we had been campaigning for. So then we published all our studies in a book which was called The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge. And we have in the meantime produced two more volumes of that. And I think this book is still the standard book for anybody who wants to really study the economic principles behind the New Silk Road. Yes, I mean, and, and the, the maps you have produced are, are just by themselves so inspirational. The way it shows the whole world being connected by by a single road, and and um, and then all the 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 investment and uh, that's required for that. It, it's a whole uh, sort of world historical step up uh, in in development. And I, I just wanted to mention that the new international economic order for us in the Caribbean. Um, you know, I was just talking with our political leader this morning, Kamala Prasad de Sessa, and about her experiences in Jamaica, because I spent years in Jamaica too, working with people who were advising the Michael Manley government. And that new international economic order was, was um, something they latched on to very, very much. They wanted to create a, a, a bauxite cartel similar to, to, um, to OPEC, the whole terms of trade. Lloyd Best, who is my personal mentor as well, was involved with, with UNCTAD and, and, and all those, those efforts to, to change the, the, um, the, the whole global economy, with, which was skewed against uh, the developing countries. And uh, Fred Wills, I know from Guyana, was also um, associated with your group. But you know, I, just found, I always found it strange when I discovered your, your, your organization that 
you know, I had learned this in school in, in, uh, when I studied at the University of Toronto, when I was in Jamaica doing my master's, when I was in the UK doing my PhD, and I had never heard of your organization. They had never mentioned it. Um, but then when I saw all the work you did and the documentation and working in Mexico with uh, Lopez Portillo and Indira Gandhi in India, and, and then um, even with Reagan later, uh, I, I just find that uh, overlooking of your organization's role uh, just astounding and curious in and of itself. But, but uh, I mean, you all have done some amazing work. I, I don't know if you want to just have a brief comment on that, Helga. Well, I think our work has been covered much more in Russia, in China, and, you know, even other countries. But I think the mainstream media in the transatlantic world, they have a different view, you know. I mean, it's not an accident that the developing countries are not developed. It took China to come and bring in, you know, the concept of the Belt and Road Initiative to finally start to realize some of the programs we had advertised for so long, you know, and the same people who kept the colonial condition of the developing countries, they naturally, they had no interest to publish our views because, you know, that would have upset the apple cart, so to speak. So I think there is a method behind this neglect. It's yes. not, it's not an accident. Mm -hmm. And, and Ralph, I'd like to bring you in too. Um, in particular, you know, your time as foreign affairs minister in the 1990s it was a tumult. I mean, it was a time of tremendous change in Trinidad and Tobago. You know, we were liberalizing. Um, we, we, we removed a lot of controls. Foreign investment uh, had come in and point Lisa, these, these sorts of things. There, there was a, a, a lot of uh, tremendous change, the, the ending of the Cold War. You know, what, what were, you know, how did you become involved in that? Because you, you, you were really known in the, you know, in, in the world of the arts rather than the uh, world of politics uh, at first. So how did you get involved in that? And, you know, what was maybe some of your most interesting experiences? I mean, maybe in the interest of time, your single most interesting experience from, from that period. And how did that experience from back then, which is now, what, 30 years ago, um, affect your understanding of, of the new Cold War, which is emerging today. All right, well, first of all, <clears throat> let me say that I'm very glad to be here with you and Helga and your other colleagues. Um, yeah, I was involved in the world of arts, um, in the world of culture, uh, performing arts, I was writing. I was involved generally in the world of ideas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I emerged from, from to, in, into awareness in the, in the 60s. Um, so I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s, which is also a very turbulent time. Um, we who graduated and came to kind of consciousness at that time, we, we wanted to change the world, improve the country, rather than go about making money individually and becoming millionaires and so on. So that, that has what, is, what has driven, uh, driven me all my life. And when you are in polit when you are in art, when you are in when you're doing Julius Caesar and you're trying, for example, to relate it to the revolution <laughs> in, in, in the 1970s and so on, it, it stirs your mind. You try your best. You want to change the society. You're doing all kinds of things in, on stage and in writing. You are also teaching at, at, at Naparima College for 30 years. And uh, some of the other in Trinidad and Tobago, it is a natural um, evolution, as it were, to enter and embrace um, the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. Because as you will know, Kurt, um, the, the politics dominates um, this country. The politicians dominate the country. And if you don't change the politics, you cannot change the country. You just cannot change the country. In, in, other, con in, other, in other societies, I suppose in more advanced societies, more enlightened societies, um, the politics, uh, politicians are not that important. Um, the politics is not that important, though it is, it, it will always be, but it, is, it doesn't dominate the mind. It doesn't dominate the consciousness. So for me, after 30 years in politics and 30, a little bit more in, in the theater and in the arts, I, I still had, I have this passion to change the society. I found what I was doing. If, 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 in, if, in if I may interrupt just a second to enhance what you're saying. 
you know, I like to tell people abroad, um, like when I'm, you know, in other countries and trying to explain the very thing you're talking about, about how politics is so important. I say, you see the way you guys talk about baseball or football or whatever. That's exactly the way we talk about politics. And that is the number one conversation that people have their obsession. It, it is what everybody, the same way you guys talk about sports, we talk about politics like that. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah. So good. So that, you know, for me, it was, it was a natural evolution, a natural step to, but I then recognize a kind of ineffectiveness in the arts. I mean, because, you know, it was a struggle, a real struggle. The arts, the drama, the theater does not have the kind of potency in Trinidad and Tobago as it would have in other societies, culturally evolved societies. So I, 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 I wanted to get out of teaching. Uh, I was prepared to sacrifice my career uh, as an artist and join the politics because I felt in the politics, you could change the society. Uh, it so happened that there was this massive election in 1986 when the People's National Movement lost um, um, badly 86, um, 33. Um, they, 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 they ended up with three people in parliament, Patrick Manning and two others. Patrick Manning, who then became the political leader. And it seemed as though they wanted to change the party, to modernize the party, to take Trinidad and Tobago along a particular path. I was enlisted and I became a willing accomplice um, with Manning, working with him um, from 1888 um, onwards to help the PNM get back into power. Uh, I was a major speechwriter for him at that time, mm -hmm. and I cut my teeth in the politics working with Patrick. Right. Who, so the speech you know, writing is, was kind of your your entree into this scene. Uh, yeah, right. speech writing was was right. my entree, and and I really got 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 into it. And um, of course, I always had an interest in foreign affairs. I, I followed foreign affairs. I I used to devour my Times magazine and Newsweek magazine. We didn't have internet and so on in those days. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a particular drug, so I used to go and get my, my editions. They used to come latest, but I, I still follow them. Um, and I, I, was, I was given the, 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 the post of foreign minister in, when we won the election in 1991. And um, I had a, an interesting career. Uh, I left the PNM, um, and some say I contributed to the demise of that government and the emergence. Of, of the United National Congress in You certainly power. were a central figure. <laughs> yeah, central figure. And um, thank you very much, Kurt. Kurt. And um, I, I retained the position as, as foreign minister under the Basde Pandey administration, so that I really effectively, the, the foreign minister of Trinidad and Tobago for all of the 90s. Yeah. And you know, it was a real eye-opener for Trinidad and Tobago that period, because from independence in 1962 till then, the economy was essentially state driven, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the government having a massive presence in the economy. We had a huge state enterprise sector, which was really suffocating the economy. Um, and private enterprise really was mainly engaged in, in the services and in the retail sector. Mm -hmm. um, some light manufacturing, as you know, would, would have started somewhere in the late, in, in, in 80s, 60, maybe around yeah, the 80s, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right? In the 80s. Um, uh, and then, but then, of course, in the in the 1990s, as, you say, as we all know, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the emergence of, of of the Bretton Woods consensus, the globalization, um, you know, the the paradigm was changing, so that we moved from what was then essentially state driven, a kind of socialist oriented economy in Trinidad and Tobago, to um, the the government at least in the minds of our administration then. Um, and that was a major shift for the PNM. Eh? That was a mm -hmm. major shift because it held on for all these years to the state driven economy. The, and in fact, that massive state enterprise sector grew under the People's National Movement. Correct. Um, and um, they, they, they began, we began to see the, well, the hierarchy of the party began to recognize that but they, I think they had already recognized it when we were in opposition 
um, and that was the new direction. But of course, they were they, they were keeping that 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 recognition, that realization, a bit muted because you know it was difficult to sell to the population at that time. Um, so that the, the the role of the state as essentially the facilitator of trade and investment in the economy emerged strongly at that time. In, in a real sense, to be, be built on some things that. The NAR administration had started in its period, 86 to 91, under the, um, the, the, the Robinson in, administration. In, in terms of your period in the 1990s as foreign affairs minister, who, the, who were, which were some of the countries that you had most interactions with? And, and, and were there any uh, countries that you perhaps opened up to that we never had relationships before, or, or we deepened in a way that we never really um you know some of my colleagues mm -hmm. some of my colleagues in fact wendell motley who was then the finance minister he said ralph you know you are the first one who brought the lexicon and the idea of the of latin america into the vocabulary of the politicians and into the consciousness so that my one of my most interesting experiences was leading the way towards a national embrace as it were of latin america uh, and also, of course, we had the first ever summit that was later down the road in the Pandey administration between the United States and the Car and CARICOM. That was another high point for me. Um, but we were, as I said, we were opening up the national consciousness towards that in America. I participated. One of the first meetings I attended as foreign minister, for example, was that meeting in um, San Pedro Sula in, in Honduras, when we had the first ever CARICOM Central American Foreign Ministers Meeting. Um, and, and that was an initiative which I, of which I'm very proud. Um, that it, it, the groundwork, of course, was laid um, during the previous administration, but it was just the groundwork. But we, we, uh, we, we, we started that meeting. And thereafter, in subsequent meetings, I, I became an advocate for a free trade area between Central America and CARICOM, because I, saw, I thought there was compatibility between the economies. I mean, even though mm -hmm. their population was much larger than, than, than ours, we could have entered into some kind of negotiation um, for free trade era. There was a lot of discussions on that um, for a while, but uh, what we ended up achieving really was some bilateral um, um, of trade agreements between CARICOM and certain individual um, Latin American countries like Costa Rica, like Panama, yeah. like, like the Dominican Republic, which was part of that um, arrangement. So that, that, that move towards um, um, Latin America was very, very you, yeah, I, I just want to um, contextualize that because people from the outside don't understand how isolated we are in the Caribbean from each other. You know, we're just seven miles away exactly. from Venezuela. But it, it's like we're closer to New York. It, right. it, it's like Venezuela is another world. It's Costa Rica is there. Uh, Domin the Dominican Republic is in the Caribbean, but it might as well be in Asia I, yeah. I, I've, in terms of, of our relationship. And that, so, so these things, people would think, oh, well, that's nothing. You have your relationship there. But it, it really did. No, it was pioneering work. Yes. It was pioneering work. It was breaking new ground. And you know the names and the capitals of these countries became part of the vocabulary of Trinidad and Tobago. We strengthened mm -hmm. ties with Mexico, with Chile, with Brazil, with Argentina. I had I paid an official um, trip, a visit to to, to Argen, Argentina, and um, to, to 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 deepen the ties. We we as CARICOM and I, as the foreign minister, we represented Trinidad and Tobago represented CARICOM on the Rio Group. Um, we participated in discussions in Brazil, in Bolivia, and at the OAS in Peru, a very remarkable meeting, which I have for my memoirs, but that is for another time. We were indeed, Kirk, uh, Kirk and, and Helga, um, heavily involved in, in, in uh, that the, the attempt, the hemispheric attempt to establish a free trade area in the entire hemisphere. Yeah. Um, so we had that summit, the historic um, hemispheric summit um, in, in, in Miami, um, what we wanted, with the decision was taken to establish this free trade area, extending from the tip of Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in, 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 in Argentina, covering everybody. It would have been the biggest 
the largest um, free trade area in the world. And uh, you know that, that, that those that as you, as I talk, as I reflect, um, my involvement and my engagement in taking Trinidad and Tobago closer to Latin America was one of the high points. The, the other thing that I was very pleased to, to be involved in, and I, 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 I make no uh, I make no apologies for claiming that I was the one who had a foreign minister's meeting in Montego Bay when I returned to the, to, 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 to the foreign ministry um, under the Pandi administration, I suggested that we have, we establish a, a US CARICOM summit. Right. My colleagues around the table, my colleagues around the tables, you know, had, had doubts, but thank God the Secretary General, then Dr. Edwin Carrington, he supported the idea. And we pursued it. We took it to the heads of government. They, they accepted that we should pursue it. I was given a lead role in preparing for the summit and pursuing it. And indeed, we did have that summit when then President Bill Clinton visited Barbados to establish the Partnership for Prosperity, Peace, and Security. My goal was for the United States to not just see CARICOM or the Caribbean as its backyard but to see us as a legitimate hemispheric partner. And right. that, that, that is the term partnership for prosperity, peace and security, which is an important document um, that we, uh, we established. Subsequently, I think you had summits on the, on the fringes of the OS meetings in, in, um, in, in, in Washington and so on, wherever they were. Um, and uh, you know that's where it's at. I, I can't. I can't say I know much about what has happened subsequently. Let, let, let me take a chance to bring uh, back Helga into the discussion. So I mean, so Ralph was, was talking about the, this opening up that was occurring in the 1990s. This is very important, and in my view, Ralph, I think the 1990s were the most progressive decade that we've had ever in our history. Uh, um, but that, that's another discussion. Um, now. Uh, you, Helga, were in Berlin. I, I don't know if you're from Berlin, but but you definitely studied there, and, whatnot, and which is the center of the old Cold War with the Berlin Wall. And I mean, for the, for those listeners who may not even be familiar with the geography, I mean, Berlin was actually physically, you know, surrounded by East Germany, but it was the kind of you know free Western part and. And then you had the, I, I guess it was, was it a road or was it a tunnel or something out to, um, uh, out to West Germany? Uh, you know, so what was your experience like during that period? And then after when it came down, was there a similar breath of, of sort of fresh air and new possibilities that say um, Ralph was describing for us in Trinidad in, in his time? Can you just, um, for, for those of us who, who don't know the German experience firsthand. Could, could you just give us a bit of a feel for that? Yeah, in the time of the Cold War, you know, Germany was divided between the GDR and the BRD, uh, West Germany and East Germany, and there was a physical wall in between. And as you say, around Berlin was a wall with a barbed wire as well. So I'm born in Trier, which is uh, the oldest city in Germany. It's more than 2000 years old. I did not have relatives in the East. And you know, when you didn't have relatives and had no connection, it was like a completely different world. I went there once or twice to buy some books because they were cheaper. Um, it was eerie, you know, it was terrible. So when the wall finally came down, um, people were overjoyed, you know, people were dancing on the Berlin Wall, and it was a moment, I called it a star hour of history. It's one of these very rare moments when you can change history, you can change the direction, and since we had this plan I was mentioning in the beginning, this Eurasian land bridge uh, conception or the preform of it, um, you know, we immediately said this is the moment to establish a peace order because communism, this was when the Soviet Union collapsed, communism had been defeated, there was no more enemy. So it was one of these golden moments, you know, and it was ripe for new ideas. So we presented this Eurasian land bridge and, you know, it was very welcomed because it would have saved the economies or the industries of the East European 
countries because it would have used those existing industries which were only obsolete from the standpoint of the world market but otherwise any developing country would have been very happy to have the industries of Czechoslovakia or Poland or, or Hungary. So, you know, there was a big recipe, 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 a big welcome for our ideas. But unfortunately, for geopolitical reasons, this was not implemented because at that time you had the Bush administration, Bush senior, Margaret Thatcher, Francois Mitterrand in France, and they had a geopolitical interest to keep Russia down, to turn the former superpower Soviet Union into a raw material third world, raw material producing and exporting third world country. And that's why Jeffrey Sachs, for example, came with his shock therapy and they reduced the industrial capacities of, the, of Russia from 91 to 94 to only 30%. And naturally, our ideas were squashed because they would have meant the integration of Eurasia as an economic motor and powerhouse. So, you know, for me, this was a lost chance. I wrote a book about it with the title The Lost Chance of 1989. And, um, you know, I, I can only hope that people learn lessons from history. If, 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 if I may add in that too, I mean, uh, part of that uh, real... Um, decay of Russia in the 1990s, uh, I mean, the, the disintegration, I mean, you have that economic statistic, but the social statistic, when you look at it, the suicide rates, the life expectancy just dropped, uh, the, and, and uh, alcoholism, and, and all sorts of, of, of just total disorder. In, they in lost society. one million people every year, demographically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, 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 was, it was a real disaster in the 1990s for them, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so go on, please. No, I, that's really what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. So le let me ask you, uh, Helga, and then I'll, I'll get back to Ralph on, on the same question. Is Now, with, with this sort of new divide happening in the world, the, the hostility between Russia and China on one side, it seems, and, and the West and the other, um, you know, so Ralph was talking about the free trade area of the Americas. We had the, the World Trade Organization, we, you know, and, and, and there was interaction commerce uh, in terms of culture, in terms of movies and, and all, all sorts of things. There was this free flowing happening for a, a good while. The Internet was very important in, in all of that. And now with all these barriers um, being erected, uh, how, wh what do you see the implications for for global development, and then in particular for developing countries like Trinidad and Tobago or elsewhere. Um, can you give me uh, your views, Helga, and then Ralph afterward? Well, I think that first of all, the meeting between President Biden and President Putin yesterday in Geneva is a hopeful step in the right direction. Uh, they reiterated the discussion between Gorbachev and Reagan at the time that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must never be fought. I was very relieved when I heard that because you know, if you have nuclear war, then we are talking about the end of civilization. So this is the first step, but it must be expanded because the geopolitical confrontation right now uh, between the so-called West and Russia and China, the main reason for that is the incredible economic rise of China. Um, I have been in China, as I mentioned, in 71, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution for the first time. And I'm regarding myself as an eyewitness. Uh, I don't need to read books about that or articles. I have seen it on my many travels to China. What an incredible civilizational contribution China made by uplifting 850 million people out of extreme poverty. And since they have offered the new Silk Road, they offer to other countries in the developing countries to repeat this economic uh, rise. Now, my view is that the best way which could happen, and frankly, I think the only way which will succeed is if the United States and China would join hands, especially in the development, uh, development of Latin America, of the Caribbean, of Central America. I mean, there are so many projects which would uplift 
the life of people in, in Trinidad, in, in, I mean, look at the, the pandemic. You know, we have members of the Schiller Institute in Peru and they gave us a heartbreaking story. They became sick of COVID and there was no hospitals. There was no oxygen. If they would not have had a large family which all worked together, they would not have survived this. Now, I think that we need a, health, a modern health system in every single country, in Haiti, in Mali, in, in, in every country, they need the same kind of a health system like we used to have in Germany before the privatization of the health sector, like the Chinese have demonstrated in Wuhan, where they were able to contain the pandemic in two months, but that requires modern hospitals, infrastructure, clean water, two billion people in the world have no access to clean water, electricity. So I think that if the United States and China and other countries would join hands and say, we have to defeat this pandemic and the danger of new ones by helping to build up modern health systems in every single country, then that would be the common mission which would lift everything out of the realm of geopolitical confrontation and serve the common aims of mankind. And that is what you know, I really think has to happen. And I would wish that a whole chorus of countries would emerge to demand exactly that. Yes, yes. And, and I mean, and, and I know at the Schiller Institute for a very long time, you've been talking about a four power summit between uh, the United States, Russia, China, India, as the four leading economies to, to, re, to, to, to recreate the global economic financial system uh, in the interest of, the, of global development. And that's something I, I, I very, very, very much support. And I mean, and I've thought about, you know, what you said in the role, small countries like Trinidad and Tobago can play in that because we have played important roles in the world. And, and because of the efforts of, of foreign affairs ministers like uh, Ralph Maraj and, and others, we have excellent relationships with virtually every country in the world. We aren't, we aren't hostile to, uh, I don't think anybody really. Um, so we have excellent relationships with China, with the United States, you know, with India, uh, even if they may have problems with each other. We, we don't have that strong relationship with Russia. Guyana does, our neighbor. Um, and, uh, but if we, for example, in Trinidad can get the United States, China, and India to cooperate on, say, some development projects here in the health sector, in, in infrastructure, in IT, in, uh, in, in some sort of thing. I, that may have an, an effect around the, the world in, in terms of their, their other uh, potential cooperation. But let, let me not uh, um, preempt uh, Ralph. I mean, I, I'd like to ask you, Ralph, in, in terms of this new, um, you know, the, the, this new kind of hostility competition, um, seeing China and Russia as, as enemies now instead of potentially working together. Um, how, how, how do you see that affecting our, um, uh, our development, um, you know, well, one I, I think, side versus another? Mm -hmm. I, think, I, think, I think we in Trinidad and Tobago, I think the world, we must first of all understand the context. Now, the old Cold War was fought between the, the two superpowers that emerged from the ashes of the world of World War II. You, you had the United States economically strong, growing stronger with the march of globalization. And you had the Soviet Union, not yet Russia, you had the Soviet Union, which was an empire, really, whose empire and influence it was collapsing under the contradictions that were inherent in its failing political and economic ideology. That was the old Cold War. The new Cold War is between what some say is a waning United States, a waning power, and a new rising economic superpower, the People's Republic of China. Now, um, ironically for some, and for me as well, it is the United States that encouraged China along this path, um, really, because it, it encouraged China's participation in the globalized economy, its membership of, of the w, WTO and so on. Notwithstanding, I mean, turning up even turning a blind eye with very, very valid concerns about its brand of state capitalism, its currency manipulation, for example, to keep its exports competitive, and which really built the foundation for its phenomenal rise. 
as an economic su superpower. If you look at the administrations from Bill Clinton, for example, straight down to Barack Obama, um, the, there was this naive belief in my view that economic prosperity would lead to the gradual growth of democracy. That was the essentially the philosophical approach then of the United States towards China. Uh, of course, maybe they didn't cater for Xi Jinping uh, and nationalist ideologue that he is. But because now uh, the US eyes are very wide open on both sides of the political divide, Republicans and, and, and Democrats. Um, regarding China and among the wider population as recent polls have consistently shown. So that we in the, in the world, in, the United, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, smaller countries, larger countries, we have to be similarly awake. We have to ask ourselves very frankly, is the US indeed a waning power? Hmm? Or is this just wishful thinking on the part of some people who have a kind of irrational anti-Americanism or because of experiences and so on. Well, it seems to me that under President Biden, America is moving pretty strongly, returning to, to he's returning America to global le leadership. For example, that recently hosted climate summit, um, it was attended by both China and Russia along with about 20 or 40 other leaders. Um, Biden is known as a com committed multilateralist. He, is a, he has reinvigorated the transatlantic ties. I, I'm sure we, we agree. Look at the very successful summit. Um, he had the G7 summit, the NATO meeting, the, 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 the meeting with, with, with Putin. The, the West now is collaborating on responses to China and, and Russia. This, this wasn't happening on the, um, the predecessor, what is his name? Um, Trump. Donald Trump. Yeah, America, uh, America has already led EU, Britain and Canada in sanctioning Chinese officials allegedly involved in the persecution of the Uyghurs. And I hope I, I pronounced that, that right. Um, he, he has led the, the, the G7 in condemning China's fundamental erosion of democracy in Hong Kong. He has revitalized the quadrilateral security dialogue with Japan. India, Australia, to check China's aggression in the Indo-Pacific. He has already held high-level security talks with South Korea and Japan to pursue to pressure North Korea to give up its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. And after the meeting with Biden, Japan's prime minister um, delivered what some call unusually blunt language to China, that Japan and the US, which are joined by a mutual defense treaty, would oppose coercion in, in, or force in the South and East China Seas, and they are stressing the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So this seems to be a strong America back in the saddle of global leadership, leading yeah, its allies me... <laughs> as it used to um, in the past. Um, and I, I think we've got, to, we've got to be aware of that. And I think it is from this position of strength that, that, that Biden has been tough with Russia. For example, banning US financial institutions from investing in new Russian government bonds through, through uh, uh, um, presidential veto, of course. He made, he made it possible for the US to sanction any part of the Russian economy. He, he, this, these are definite disincentives for US firms to do business in Russia. 10 Russian diplomats were also expelled, sanctions imposed against 38 individuals and companies for interfering in US elections and conducting cyber attacks. And most interestingly, some weeks ago, whilst he was on the phone to Putin, you know, complaining about the massive buildup of forces, including 83,000 troops along the Ukrainian border, Biden had already had two American warships um, steaming from the Black Sea from a naval base in Spain. And it was his, his, his muscularity um, uh, was, was supported by the UK, the EU, EU NATO, uh, and so on. So that I have no doubt that set the stage for that meeting that he had with Putin. Putin recognized, the world had recognized that they are dealing with a very different president from the one previous. Um, who had talked about uh, um, Donald Trump's America's first, fool America first foolishness. 
and he, he had a very successful week. So we have got to know that we are dealing with a, a strong America. And um, you know, what, what about what about what about China? What, what about China? Um, this the, 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 the are we going are we going to allow ourselves now into the arms of an autocratic China? whose Belt and Road Initiative is being used as, as an instrument for Beijing's acquisition of strategic assets around the world. That is the general complaint. I mean, look at what has happened to Sri Lanka's Hamban Tota port, for example. So people must open their eyes. They must begin to comprehend. Uh, in my view, there's too much elementariness at the highest level. Um, and I, I go on. Uh, yeah, well, let, let me bring Hel Helga in, but but I, I I do want to say just a tiny bit uh, uh, about the the um, I I do find that it it's very strange that when people talk about China, uh, let's say the, the Sri Lankan port, but I mean let's say in Trinidad and Tobago's experience, I mean Point Lisas was all ours, all built by our taxpayer money, but they're all in the hands of Western companies now because of our debt crisis with the IMF. And it, it's the debt, it, it, it's not something unique to China at all. And in, in fact, all, I mean, all our, our, our oil industry is in the hands of, of the West. It's, it's, it's not in our hands. So, so I mean, I, I think it's, it's important for national development to talk about these questions. I, I, I just think that for some reason, we've had a blind spot for so long for these things. And, and now so I, are you saying, our, are you our saying eyes are you open. Are... So I'm, I'm glad our eyes are open. Um, but but uh, but certainly, um, you know, we, we, we should look at it uh, in a global perspective. But but I know Helga um, has a lot to, uh, a lot to say on that. So let me invite okay. her to to um, to give her opinion. But, you know, with all uh, due respect and sympathy, Minister, um, <clears throat> I think you have a narrative which is entirely the narrative of the colonial powers, the G7 who just met in in England, in Great Britain. I mean, look at what happened with the uh, two uh, destroyers trying to go into the Black Sea. This was on April 13th. And at that point, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia, Ryabkov, warned and said, you are playing with fire because this is crossing the red line uh, for Russia. And they turned, returned because they realized that they were on the verge of World War III. I mean, you cannot play with that. There were a whole bunch of very serious uh, statesmen and, and politicians in the recent time who have warned that, you know, that we could have World War III. Kissinger, for example, not exactly a friend of, of my husband over the decades, he warned and said, you know, that we are, that, that we are about to have a war between Russia, uh, between the United States and China, which could lead to the annihilation of civilization and that this confrontation must be stopped. Daniel Ellsberg, the whistleblower from the Pentagon Papers uh, said the same thing and he called on whistleblowers in the Pentagon to speak up uh, because we are so close to war. And then one of them, a person called Franz, Franz Gale, who worked until a couple of days ago or weeks ago in, in the Pentagon, he wrote an article uh, called uh, how, how the United States uh, fought a, a war with China and lost, where he says that exactly over Taiwan, you would have a, a, a possible war, but the United States would lose. You know, and then the question is, will it come to the use of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. or not? We are sitting on the brink of a disaster. And I think we need to get a completely different thinking than that which you again, with all sympathy and respect, but I think your thinking is outmoded. It's the old time of geopolitics, and it is exactly that kind of confrontationist policies, which has led to two catastrophes in the 20th century. And I can only hope that we reach a different cooperation, which China has offered, which Putin has offered, and it was NATO, which betrayed all the promises which were given uh, to Gorbachev at the time, uh, you know, they always say it was not true that the promise was to never expand NATO. In the meantime, documents can be seen in the archives in Washington, which say exactly what the ambassador Medlock, the former 
U.S. ambassador to in Moscow had said many times, Horst Telschik, uh, the advisor of Helmut Kohl, have testified that such promises were made. And now you look, where is NATO? NATO has expanded 1,000 kilometers closer to the east. They are sitting in, at the Russian border. And you know a lot of these things are exactly the opposite, as you were implying. First of all, you know this, the narrative about Ukraine. It was not that Russia annexed uh, Crimea. It was that there was a coup uh, pushed by, uh, among others, Victoria Nuland in the State Department, who bragged that the State Department paid $5 billion for NGOs uh, to build up the Maidan. And then in February 2008, uh, 2014, you had a coup which brought in the Bandera uh, Nazis from, from the past. You know, and then as a result of that coup, the people of Crimea had a democratic vote and voted that they wanted to be part of Russia, which they had been previously uh, until the beginning of the 50s. So, I mean, a lot of these narratives, it, it's a fight for the narratives, but I can tell you as a, as a time witness and as an active politician in many of these affairs in Europe, that the picture you were portraying, unfortunately, is not based on reality at all. Um, of course, we'll have, to, we'll have to disagree mm. on that, um, mm. respectfully. Um, I, I don't share that view at all. I, I hold strongly to the view that I, that I have espoused. Um, I don't see what um, Mr. Putin is interested in, except maintaining his autocratic power in, 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 in Russia. And, um, you know, when you look at what is happening in China, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the attitude, um, the approach of Mr. Xi Jinping is such that um, many believe that he is a nationalist ideologue whose interest is in restoring China to its preeminent role, um, preeminent to the, its preeminence as a power, as a civilizational power. And um, he, he's seeking to, to achieve and restore this after what he himself has called, um, I suppose, ju ju justification, um, centuries of humiliation at the hands of the Western world. Now, what Xi has done is consolidated power nationally. He has made himself virtual president for life. He eliminates rivals and he's increasing state control of the economy and society. Dissent has um, been largely suffocated, quickly snuffed out. And um, of course, the COVID has um, facilitated that authoritarianism. Now we talk about Russia and China as being on one side of the Cold War. Russia is not that important, except that what makes Russia important now is the fact that it continues to have a nu nuclear power. Um, without that, Russia is, is, a, is, is really an intermediate power. Um, and that is really what makes Russia um, um, very, very important. Uh, it, it's, it's weaponry and, and, and its army. And I think that um, uh, the, the attitude, the approach, of, of President Biden would have to be, in my view, to somehow enlist Russia in, in, in a cause, in, in the cause of, of a humane civilization, whether that is possible or not. Uh, on the other hand, the focus, I think, is mainly, is mainly, if we are talking about a new Cold War, the, the focus is, from the United States perspective, is mainly on Beijing, um, which is increasingly assertive in the Indo-Pacific. It is militarizing the South China Sea. It is threatening forced reunification with Taiwan, eroding democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. It is claiming the Senkaku Islands administered by Japan since the 19th century. It is reigniting a Himalayan border conflict with India. And with its Belt and Road Initiative, it has gained influence and power in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, Latin America, the Caribbean, including Trinidad and Tobago, 
where administrations have taken its loan and sung its praises. I just hope that um, we all open our eyes um, to the reality. This is not to say, and I think we, that's your other question, um, Kurt, um, Kurt, that um, we should take sides, but I think we've got to be aware from our own perspective, um, you know, how, yeah. what, what, what the reality is. I, in, I, in the cold I, I have to say that, um, I mean, be, being a, a uh, you know, a, a, a very, fur, um, you know, uh, uh, out of Lloyd Best's camp myself. And I mean, in, in the 60s, Lloyd, Lloyd wrote a, a very, very important paper called Independent Thought and Caribbean Freedom. Uh, it was really a foundational document for the New World Movement, and, and which was extremely influential throughout the, the region. And, um, and, and he had, I, I think it's, it's, it's as relevant today as it was in 1965 when he wrote it, um, looking at the Cold War then, uh, because people were taking sides in the capitalist versus communist world. And, and, and essentially, if, if I were to summarize it uh, in simpler language, it would be like, listen, um, you know what? Neither of these blocks are truly interested in our development. We are the only ones who really, first of all, have responsibility for our development. And, and, and really, we, we shouldn't even expect the other people to want to develop it. This is our responsibility. And we must not get involved in their skirmishes and their wars, because in the end, we will just be pawns in, in whatever they do, because they don't even understand us. They don't even understand our countries in the first place. And, yeah. and whatever prescriptions they have, has no idea about our history, our sociology, our culture, our economies, and, and it is all wrong, right? It's based on wrong theories, wrong interpretations. And so, so his, his view is, is that, uh, you know, was that we should focus on our responsibility of development in our own countries and not get involved, however tempting it is to, you know, in, in, in this global fight, because everybody in the whole world is, is talking about it and saying you must choose a side one side or the other, but our first responsibility is, is for ourselves. So from that perspective, which is where I, I really come from, um, uh, we in, in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, have close relationships with China, have close relationships with America. And you, you must continue to uh, uh, Yeah, and, and, and both into economic, political, et cetera. You as a foreign, a former uh, foreign affairs minister, spanning both administrations throughout the 90s. What, what is your, your view of, of that and, and its potential? And, you know, it, do, do you think we need to choose one side or the other? Uh, do, do you think we need to be closer to one or the other? Do you think we can have a role in, in I don't know, bringing out some sort of harmony, at least this level? I, well, what's your thinking on it? I, uh, I don't think we should choose sides at all. I right. don't think we should choose sides at all. Um, I think we have to remain neutral. We, we were part of the non-aligned movement, which is That's essentially right. that was, what, what, what was about. Um, we were non-aligned in the Cold War, in the old Cold War. I suppose we must remain non-aligned, but we now, but we must also recognize what the realities are. What yeah. the realities are. We can't turn our bl blind eyes. We can't. Um, pretend to be non-ideological when mm -hmm. essentially we are taking ideological positions. Yeah. Um, there's an anti-American feeling in Trinidad and Tobago that yeah. I find completely irrational. That's and right. Complete, and completely hypo hypocritical. Yes. I mean, people Agreed. who depend on the United States, we have a huge diaspora finding meaning and productive lives in the United States, which they couldn't find here. Um, they go to the United States, they yes. look to the United States. The United States remains our largest trading partner, main source of foreign direct investment. They are our hemispheric yeah. neighbor, and yeah. yet people take this irrational anti-American approach. I think even our own government. The, Agreed. The, the, uh, prime uh, minister, uh, the prime yes. minister of Trinidad and present <clears throat> prime minister, he is part of that irrational anti-American sentiment, Agreed. which has and, no and, basis. And, yeah, Lloyd Bess used to say that all the time. He, he, he found the anti-Americanism of, of, of the, the left 
in here and, and the intellectuals to be totally, totally unrealistic, unfounded and hypocritical, actually. Well, you know? yeah, I agree. And, and let me let you know, I mean, you would know by now that Lloyd Bess is, is also my guru in a way. Yes. Um, you, 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 you understand? So that is my position. I am saying we have to recognize some of the realities that I mentioned. You, you know what I mean? Yep, Keep an yep. open mind to it. Um, but for me, very, very importantly, we cannot ignore the reality that we espouse the norms of democracy and human mm -hmm. rights in Trinidad and Tobago. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. We cannot deny, uh, ignore that. We cannot ignore that. Yeah. Uh, so does the United States. Whilst in my view, China, the People's Republic of China, especially under this president, it is driven by a brutal autocracy, in my view, that denies democratic freedoms and violates human rights of its own people. Look at the genocide that is now, that has already taken place with respect to that Muslim minority in its northern province, the Uyghur um, and, and civilization. And as I said, we also cannot ignore the reality of geography and history, which has brought us under US influence from which we have benefited. Yeah. But we have also maintained in the, in our independence yeah. uh, in a, to, to a certain extent, thanks to the original approach of Dr. Eric Williams. Um, we, we have, but, we, but we can't continue with, with that and take it to an extreme and, and, and talk about anti-Americanism yeah. all the time. We've got to see the beauty in the relationship what is possible um and as i say that is what we have to do we have we got to be realistic we've got to be but we've got to be neutral uh you know let, and, yeah, and, and, and always be aware of our own interests exactly. I mean, and, 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 and our yeah. own interests you, you you know foreign foreign affairs is the pursuit of enlightened self-interest that right. is what it is now i um we are approaching the end and, and I want uh, Helga to, to jump in with some final comments, but and also to please tell us about your upcoming conference as well, um, which is very much related to these issues and, and, and trying to transcend the, these divides. I mean, we, we, we're not going to solve uh, world issues here on this program, I know that, or, or, or our differences of opinions, but, but I, I do think that you know the your conference, its goals. It's it's. it's I, I think it would be hard to to disagree with a lot of it. Uh, uh, so could you please let us uh, know? Uh, well, I could answer uh, the arguments of uh, you, the minister. I, unfortunately, I forgot your name now. Uh, right. You know, I Ralph could mention uh, yes. Uh, I could mention the terrible effect of sanctions. Sanctions are a form of warfare and they're killing people. I could mention the lies of the endless wars, uh, the Iraq war. I could mention Madame Albright, who said that the death of 500,000 Iraqi children as a consequence of sanctions were a price worth to be paid. I mean, if you think that that is such a demonstration of human rights and democracy, I can't, I can't agree. I mean, this is disgusting, but I'm not going to do that because we are trying to find a different approach. The upcoming Schiller Institute conference on the 26th and 27th, that is uh, 10 days from now, uh, will have the subject, uh, a world for the common good of all and not rules based, uh, a rule-based order for the interest of a few. So we, are, we will try to bring in um, you know, we have a strategic panel which will bring in speakers from Russia, China, the United States, uh, countries from, from Europe, from uh, Africa. And we are trying to get a dialogue between all of these different parties for the common good of mankind. Because I think we have reached in history a period where we absolutely must reach a new paradigm of cooperation and not of confrontation. So then we will have a big panel on science. This will be the scientists from Africa, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Holland, United States. And they will discuss the science of climate change because it's not true that the anthropogenic climate change is the only explanation. I mean, these are all scientists who are talking about astronomical, uh, astronomic, astronomical 
oscillations, the position of the galaxy, the position, what happens on the sun. So this will be very, very important for anybody who really wants to study the science of climate change in an unideological way. Then we will have a very important panel on the 27th on the danger of hyperinflation, because all this money pumping, which has occurred mm -hmm. after 2008, and especially since the pandemic and the so-called stimulus packages, trillions and trillions of dollars and euros and whatnot else have been pumped into the system, which now shows up as hyperinflation. And in Germany in 1923, when the Reichsbank uh, printed money more than the German economy could uh, work for, it came to a hyperinflationary collapse. And this is the danger now, not in one country, but in the entire transatlantic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the Federal Reserve was talking about a temporary hyperinflation. I mean, that's as, you know, as a woman can be a little bit pregnant. I mean, it just does not exist. When you enter a hyperinflationary collapse, then that's it. And the only remedy against that is a Glass-Steagall to go back to the kind of banking separation of Franklin D. Roosevelt, how he ended the depression and the, the big economic crisis of the early 30s. So that will be also economists from many parts of the world discussing this. Then we will have a, a whole a discussion on the principle of the coincidence of opposites. This is a beautiful conception by Nicolaus of Kuhs. He's a great thinker of the 15th century. He's the father of the modern nation state. He actually invented the representative Republican system. He invented a new method of thinking, which he called coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites, which says that the difference between man and animal is that you know man is the one human being capable of reason. And therefore, the human mind can always think a level where the one has a higher quality and a higher power than the many. And that method was, for example, applied in the Peace of Westphalia, ending 150 years of religious war. And as you know, the Peace of Westphalia laid the foundation for the evolution of international law, of people's law. This went into the UN Charter. Uh, this went into the Bandung Conference, since you mentioned the non-aligned movement. You know, this was the contribution also of Mahatma Gandhi, Nehru, Shu Enlai, who formed the five principles of uh, peaceful coexistence. And it is these ideas which must guide today uh, the approach to solve conflicts, because otherwise, you know, if you if you just you know stick to confrontation we are risking the existence of this beautiful human species. So this will be very elevated. We will have a lot of culture, a lot of classical music, poetry, uh, a dialogue of civilization, you know, because I think that if people start to know other cultures, then their view changes. You know, once you start to see the beauty of Indian culture, of the Vedic writings, of the mm -hmm. Gupta periods, mm -hmm of the Chinese uh, song uh, uh, dynasty, uh, poetry, painting, uh, you understand that, you know, indeed China, as you mentioned, was for many thousands of years, the leading nation in the world. They contributed many inventions um, and they were actually a leading nation until the 18th century or the 17th century. And then only when the colonial power started to give them a hard time with the opium wars and so forth. This all got got shattered. But you know, China is not an aggressive nation. I mean, you cannot convince me of that because you know China has a completely different value system and a democracy. Uh, it's just that uh, it's not the it's not the Western democracy. Anyway, I don't want to discuss China. Yeah. I just want to invite all of your viewers um, <clears throat> to come to our conference because you will see that this is an extremely important alliance of people from all over the world who are looking for a new paradigm, how to get to a better period in history than having wars. Right. Well, thanks very much. I, I, I imagine uh, we, we've come to the end of the program. 
uh, is, is that what you wanted to, to ask about, Ralph? Yes, uh, I, I, yeah, because, you know, I have gotten another... Engagement. Yes, yes, exactly. I, 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 and, and, and we have come to the end. And I want to thank both of you so much for this fascinating and interesting discussion. Um, okay. I, I know, you know, two different points of views, but, you know, uh, but in the end, we are all for the... for. For, yeah. for global in, in fact in fact in, in fact uh, i don't i don't i don't think the world needs a, a, a new cold war at this time you know exactly, exactly. I, I think multilateralism is critical for our common survival i think globalization must continue but it needs a more human face Correct. the tremendous wealth that it generates um we, we must sure ensure that the huge divide between in and between countries is eradicated That's you, right. know, you, you know those are the things we we, must, we need the spread of the democracy um respect of the human rights and freedoms there must be war and poverty on the development in all its forms and, mm -hmm. and and that is what we need in the world so i think helga and i are essentially i think if i may say so saying have the, the same aspirations you know, I think yes. so. I, 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 I honestly I invite do. you to participate in, in our war, conference. The new Cold War is a reality. It is a reality which we must also face up to. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, that's it for this week's episode of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. We were talking with our guests, Helga Zeplarouche and Ralph Miraj on geopolitics, the new Cold War, and developing countries. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for watching and listening. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, follow, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. If you're watching on YouTube, please also click the bell icon so you get notifications when our programs are uploaded. Thanks again, and see you next week.